All right. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. We'll we'll uh, give people just a moment or two to come on in and show up for uh, class tonight. But we are on to Galatians chapter three, and <clears throat> Galatians chapter three may be one of the grandest chapters of the New Testament, if not the entire Bible. It is a fantastic bit of writing. Um, I, I enjoyed it so much going over it this morning. Um, it's longer than anyone we've done so far, and yet I realized I, I translated it relatively quickly. Uh, quicker than I thought I was going to, so I had uh, time to have a nice pipe before uh, class tonight. Um, we're going to get started in a minute or two, but if you have any questions you who are here before we begin, please do feel free to uh, type them up into the comments, and I will get to them, and, uh, <clears throat> and we'll start in just a moment. So, um, as a note, uh, Sue dropped off some uh, wonderful coffee by Gillespie that she wasn't going to be able to use. And it was a Colombian, and this is something I've discovered, and it's my own personal preference. Um, with the, the South American coffees and the Central American coffees, I like them better when I make them in my little drip coffee pot in my office, just a little five cupper. Um, for the African ones, I like them much better when I make them in the bun. And again, they just brew different water temperatures and different rates and all that. And it's just different things come out. So, okay, that really had nothing to do with much of anything. But it's, we're, we're approaching seven, and I'll, I'll start talking about Galatians 3 uh, properly at, at seven. So, um, <clears throat> if there aren't any other questions, oh, I guess we should dive on in. So, Galatians 3, verse 1. Now, if you will recall, before we dive in, the, the first two chapters had really been Paul doing a lot of history. And you know, I, 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 this is what I've done. You know who I am. I'm not under any person's authority like these peons who are messing with you are. I, I, I was sent by Jesus. I preached the gospel of Christ. I don't let anyone else do anything other than the gospel of Christ. I'll, I'll even oppose Peter if Peter's off the reservation. And he'll even admit that I'm right. So, now we get verse three, uh, chapter 3, verse 1. O oh, unthinking Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your eyes was not Jesus prescribed, set down in writing, as crucified. Okay, folks, what's going on? Where's your mind? Use your head. Um, if, you, if you've ever seen the coach chew out the team and do the what were you thinking sort of thing, that's what's going on here. This is that same movement, that same angle, that, that they are unthinking. Why? They've been bewitched. They've been the, 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 they've been put under a spell. Someone has hoodwinked you in a, in a manner most satanic and demonic. Why? I showed you Christ and him crucified. The thing that I put down, that I, I literally put in writing in front of you is the idea. But basically it's the, that I, I drove in. I, I set in stone... Christ and him crucified. That's what you're supposed to be looking at. You are supposed to be paying attention to Christ and him crucified. What else are you looking at? Why are you looking at something that isn't Christ and him crucified? Uh, the image I like to think of is, what do we have in front of the church? It's the big giant cross. If you're hearing sermons or talk that has nothing to do with Christ and him crucified, why are you listening to it? That's not the point. All right? So again, it, it's, it, this is the nice, gentle, oh, yeah, oh, okay, that's a good story. And then, yeah, yeah, it's a good story, right? Whack! What are you doing? It, it, it's, it's, it's beautiful. Like, if, if you think of the, uh, 
like, like the, the, the you see where the nice Italian grandpa goes, oh yeah, come here, whack, what you doing? This is what he says here. And then verse 2 is a beautiful, blunt statement. This alone I wish to learn from you. Okay. Um, just as a note, when the teacher says, oh, let, let me learn something from you, there's a little bit of a, you've been too big for your britches, student. This alone I wish to learn of you. From the works of the law, did you receive the Spirit? Or by hearing of faith, by hearing faithfully. All right, so tell me this, people. Uh, how did you receive the Holy Spirit? Did you receive the Holy Spirit by what you did? Or did faith come by hearing? Oh, yeah, faith comes by hearing. Sue, the coffee is lovely, especially drip point. And so right away, <clears throat> Paul brings up something very simple. I had told you what was going on. I had, I had laid down Christ and you were supposed to listen to that. And when you listen to that, you had the Holy Spirit working upon you. And it was good. And you've been listening to these works, guys. And you're all fearful and, oh, what are we going to do? What are you thinking? Why are you listening to these people? They're not giving you the Spirit. The works of the law are not producing the Holy Spirit. Why? Why listen to them? Brr. This is a, a, a very frustrated uh, tongue lashing. It continues. Verse 3. Are, are, you, are you so unthinking? Are, are, you, are you so mindless that beginning the Spirit, now you, you are finished? In the flesh. And this is weighted, because this word for our, our, that you started in the spirit, but now you're going to end, you're going to be completed, you're going to be finished off by the flesh. And that, that word there for, for end, completed, it's the same thing that Jesus says, it is finished. This is a strong Christ and Christian crucified word. So yeah, our completion, our finish, our fulfillment is in Christ and in crucified. What are you looking to your own flesh for? You're supposed to be looking at Christ. And so there's just this, it's this rapid fire. Boom, boom. What are you doing? What are you thinking? Verse 4. All this did you suffer vainly? For, for if it is in vain, did, did, you, did you go through all this stuff? Did you, when I preached the gospel to you, there was reaction against it. And, and if you, okay, if you look at the book of Acts, whenever Paul goes around and the gospel is preached, faith comes, but there's opposition to faith. And, and, and there's suffering. And, and there's opposition. And basically, as Paul has left, you've had the Judah come and say, oh, just get circumcised and everything will be nicer. You, you stood up for the faith, and you suffered. Was that, was that in vain? Are you, are you wimping out now? Um, <clears throat> one, of the, uh, one, of the, one of the things that stick with, sticks with me from seminary, uh, one of the professors that I dearly love, in fact, the man who preached my uh, ordination, was Professor Timothy Quill. Dr. Quill is a uh, very good preacher. He has that, that, that's his blick. Uh, he also would do uh, how to conduct the service, things like that, pastoral practice. Um, he was also in charge of the Russian project. Uh, in the late 90s, he was the one who coordinated. Basically, we brought over 20, 25 students from Siberia and trained that crop of, of pastors to basically... Once communism fell and the church could be open in Siberia, we raised up the pastors and sent them back over. And so, yeah, I, I, I know a lot of the bigwig pastors in Siberia now because they were finishing up seminary when I showed up. Um, but one of the beautiful things about Professor Quill was he had a, a wonderful folksy way of being honest. A 
and, and he looked at us the one day and he said, the simple fact is five years, 10 years from now, some of you will have wimped out and we won't know you anymore. And this is what Paul is asking. Are you going to, have you wimped out? Have you bailed on the faith for the sake of making the people who nag you happy? Is that, is that what does it? And then verse five. Uh, therefore, uh, does the, the one who, who choreographed you into the spirit and who, who worked mightily amongst you, was this done by works of the law or by hearing faithfully? Uh, the, there's a really neat word here. How, I want to see how the ESV translates it. Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing of faith? That sounds very nice, but the, the idea of does he who supplies, does the, the Greek word here, I'm going to ask, I am going to write a Greek word on the board because life is fun. Because you know this word. It is epi core a go. Epi go. Oh, what is that? Well, epi is a pawn. A pawn. Chore uh, of uh, choreography. It, 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 it's not just that you, you supply, but it's the setting up of the dance. The, the, the running of things, it, it, it's providing, it's organizing, it's setting up, it's establishing in, in the way that is full of uh, the, the beautiful order, the, the, the beauty of the dance. Did the one who literally had you dancing with the spirit, not, I don't mean like in Pentecostal way, but the, the beautiful dance of, of faith and life where, where you were doing things that were beyond you and Christ was living in you, did that happen? By the works of the law? No, the works were the result of that. No, it happened by the, the hearing of faith. Faith comes by hearing. Um, I just lost my marker. No, I, I put it right there. The, the, the neat thing with this is you have this, this beautiful thrust, this beautiful focus. You need to be people hearing faithfully listening to the preaching of Christ and him crucified, and that's where strength is. If you cut yourself off, and Paul will use this language later on, if you cut yourself off from listening to Christ, you lose the spirit, you lose your strength, you lose everything, you lose life. Christ is where it's at, and we receive that all by faith. And then Paul is now going to start undercutting the... Uh, the Judaizers, as you will call them, the ones who say, "Oh, well, you got to do what Abraham. You, you, you've got to, you've got to be Jewish." Oh, really? Well, let's see. Verse six. Just as Abraham, <clears throat> just as Abraham uh, believed God, and it was reckoned to him, it was logic to him, it was accounted to him as righteousness, or to be righteousness. Um, yeah, you want to be like Abraham? Uh, Abraham wasn't saved by works of the law. He was saved by hearing faithfully what God had said. God made promises and Abraham listened and believed and God then worked mightily in Abraham. Faith comes by hearing for you just as it did for Abraham. These people were making mountains out of circumcision and, stuff, and the works of the law. They don't understand Abraham. They don't understand the faith. So, all right. So we're, we'll, we'll we'll pause there for a moment. Um, are there any questions at the moment before we uh, we set up and go on? Because we we finish this first paragraph. What Paul does in this little section is he wakes the Galatians up and reintroduces, yes, the fact that faith comes by hearing. That is central. Faith, power, everything good comes from hearing the gospel of Christ the crucified. And you're not going to get that by what you do. 
What you do does not strengthen you. What you do does not empower you. You are strengthened, you are saved, you are redeemed by hearing. And, and these people who claim to be nice little Jewish boys and sons of Abraham, so you ought to listen to us, they don't know the first thing about Abraham. And so what we're going to do is we're going to go on to a, a nice discussion on Abraham in the Old Testament. Um, one of our weaknesses today is that we don't know the Old Testament as well as we ought. And, and in fact, I, I mentioned this, I think it was on the Sunday morning Bible study, that our distinction between Old and New Testament is a little artificial. It, it, it's not as though there's a radical change. It's all one story. From Genesis to Exodus, it is the story of God working out salvation. And uh, Luther would say, what is, what is hidden in the old is made explicit in the new. It, it, it's, it's the rolling out of things. So, so it would sort of be like saying the, uh, the last ten chapters of the great mystery book aren't part of the same book, aren't part of the, the, the first 40 chapters of the book aren't the same thing because, well, well you, you see things revealed in the last ten chapters. No, it, it's, the, it's the same story. And <clears throat> what we're going to get here is some understanding of the Old Testament. So a little bit of chronology very quickly. When we think of Abraham, that is roughly 2000 BC. Uh, 2000 to 1900 BC. Because he lived. He, he leaves... Oops, I went off the thing. <laughs> he leaves uh, his home when he's 75, because God says, I'm going to make a great nation of you, so on and so forth. Uh, doesn't happen over and over, keeps making the promises. Uh, God promises circumcision later on. Circumcision came after the promise. This is important to remember. And so on and so forth. And then you have his children, and then you have Moses. Right around 1450 BC is when the Exodus happens and all that type of stuff. So, so that's roughly the, the time frame that we're talking about. Um, so just with that in mind, because that'll play up in just a moment. All right, I'm not seeing any questions, so I'm going to carry on at verse 7. Therefore, you know, you, you should know, you should experience that the, the, the ones who are of faith, these ones are the sons of Abraham. If you want to be a son of Abraham, it's not biology. It's not genealogy. Father Abraham had many sons, and many sons had by, by faith. If you want to be, if you want to share in who Abraham is, that's you share in the faith. The faith that we proclaim of Christ and him crucified is the same faith that Abraham held. It's just we see it played out, whereas he uh, had faith in what was to come. Same thing. Verse 8. For the scriptures foresaw that uh, by faith, God would justify, would make right the nation. Um, Pre-gospeling this to Abraham, saying, um, in you all the nations of the earth will be blessed, will be, will be put into blessing. It's a, a really neat idea here that, that comes up. Um, the, the idea that, yeah, a Abraham got the gospel beforehand. It's not as though no one had ever heard the gospel until Paul showed up. No, no, the gospel's all over the place in the Old Testament. The promise of salvation in the Messiah is all over the place in the Old Testament. In fact, that's the main promise to Abraham. In you, all nations of the earth will be blessed. Why? Because the Messiah will come from you, Abraham. All right? Verse 9. So then, they are blessed right along with Abraham, 
by faith in the faith of Abraham. So they are blessed by faith, just as Abraham was blessed by faith. Abraham received everything that he got, not because of works, but by faith. So if you want to have what Abraham had, if you want to be on the same part of Abraham, you got to, it's faith. That's what defines it, not, oh, look at what I do in my work. No, everything is by faith. Abraham is the great man of faith, not the great man of works. And in fact, if you read your Bible, you'd see that sometimes Abraham has some uh, works that are shady. In fact, this is one of the things that, that comes up. I, I, yes, I'm going to do this. All right. <clears throat> I, I'm going to say a rant that might be very bad and, and sound lousy. There's a problem that comes up with often how we teach our kids Bible stories. We sometimes pick and choose the Bible stories a little too cleanly. And some of that's simply because we're trying to cover a lot of stuff. I, uh, we're, we're looking at, we're going, right now we're going for the Sunday School material. And uh, last week was Ruth. Next week will be God makes Saul king. And then the next week after that will be David and Goliath. And then uh, David becomes king, I think. But I mean, just these massive jumps. And there's tons of stuff that goes on. We pick the highlights. And, and so often... There's a downside to that, because the scriptures don't just show us the highlights. They show us the reality of these men who are sinners, fighting against sin, sometimes not always doing the best against their sin, and yet who are called back to faith in God and his promises. We see failings of people in the scriptures to remind us that it's not a matter of salvation by works. It's not a matter of, oh, Abraham was just so awesome that, that oh, just, just do what Abraham did. No, it, it, Abraham was a human being who, who faced down temptations, some like what we would face and some so weird and bizarre that we have no idea how to comprehend them. And sometimes things go well, and sometimes things go poorly. But once again, God calls Abraham back to faith. And that's what goes on. Same thing with David. Um, I taught a Bible study on, on 1 Samuel. And people get shocked sometimes when they see some of the things that David does. And if we went into 2 Samuel, it would be even worse, because there are times David drops the ball. Um, how many of you, just off the top of your head, know the story of when God curses David with leprosy for disobedience? We don't generally get that story in Sunday school. We just have, boy, David who's full of confidence, and David who's great, and go be like David. And in part, that's because we've almost used the Bible as, as the morality training thing. And, and and that, that's part of what the scriptures are for. But our salvation isn't on the basis of our morality or the basis of our works. Our salvation is from faith, by Christ, by faith in Christ Jesus. And, and when we see the entirety of the stories, when we see the, the whole of the life of David, the whole of the life of, of, of Abraham, you see that play out, that faith is what has to set the stage, not works. And so what happens is there's that temptation to pick and choose the highlights and, and say, oh, this is just what I do. And, and you miss the point of faith in the promise. And uh, that's one of the things that comes up. Of course, so that's, that's my, my loudness. I'd much rather have some of the messier stories show up in Sunday school class. But that might also be harder to teach, but more useful to teach. So, let's carry on. Verse 10. For whoever is by the works of the law, whoever, whoever exists, whoever lives by works of the law, they are under a curse. They are under imprecation. Impreca uh, imprecations. 
They are, they are with the sword of Damocles over their head. They are waiting for punishment. That's the idea here. For it is written, um, curses be upon everyone who does not remain all that has written in the book of the law and does them. If you're going to live by the law, you had better do everything. If, if you are going to make your claim that you do everything right, then you better follow everything to the letter. Otherwise, it, you're going to get deemed. So, uh, Gene notes, we often use them as heroes. We do, and, and they are heroes, and they do things that are heroic. But we're not saved by the fact that we're heroes. We're saved by the fact that we live by faith. And just as important, just as important is, is seen in people the warnings of what you ought not do. I will use my dad as an example. Um, no pastor has influenced me more than my dad. And there are many things that I do as a pastor that I've learned from him to do well. And, and there are some things that I, I wish I could do as well as my dad, and I can't. But I also saw some of the mistakes my dad made, the blunders my dad has made. And I've learned from those. I've learned that, oh, I might need to avoid getting myself in that position. Or, okay, I know I have my dad's temper as well. Maybe I need to handle things. I, I've... I, I've learned from the way that my dad faced temptation as well. And, and we, we do ourselves a disservice if we only look at, at the successes of the, the saints who have gone before us rather than the, the hardships they faced. I mean, this is one of the things that Paul does quite often. He'll talk about where he was apart from faith. Not because that's the glory days, but because... I, I know that pit. I, I know how you can fall into that. I know what it feels like. Don't fall into that pit. Don't, don't go that way. And we, we need some of those warnings as well, rather than just the, uh, the role model type of stuff. Uh, you, you, need, you need both. You need both positive and negative examples. And in, in so many of the saints of the Old Testament, we get both. And yet we're often tempted to ignore them. So, or ignore the, uh, the negative examples of this. So, but we should, because it's not just a matter of, oh, try and be a little bit more like David, and that's all good. No, if, if you think you're saved by works of the law, well, if you don't do it all, you're in trouble. Verse 11. For, uh, but, but that by the law, that in the law, no one is righteous, before God is clear, is, is day long, it, it's daylight obvious. For the righteous by faith shall live, or, or the, the righteous one shall live by faith. It, 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 it works all together that way. Even the Torah, even, even what Moses writes points out, the just shall live by faith. That, that's Old Testament language. That, that's this is clear. E even, even the Old Testament is clear that we live by faith. So why do you think that, you that, that your life comes from, oh, I do the law so well? No, that, that doesn't create anything. Galatians 3.13. Uh, 3, um, let's see. Hang on. Oh, okay, okay. I can read much more. Ah, that's, got it. Uh, Christ purchased you. He, he brought you out. He redeemed you from the curse of the law by becoming uh, for you the curse himself. Becoming a curse. For it is written, uh, curses upon everyone who hangs upon a tree or who is hung upon a tree. Oh, no, that was for us. Christ purchased us. The, uh, 
when we talk about Jesus being our redeemer or, or purchased and won us from sin, death, and the devil, the implication is that the law demands payment. If you break it, you bought it. And you, bro you broke it, so someone has to buy it. And Christ pays for us. He takes up the curse himself. That's what the cross is. How can you think someone's saved by works when what we have in front of us, the cross, showing that the, the, the law demands our death? That's what the cross is. It is an instrument of death. The wages of sin is death. Behold the wages of your sin. But you're not going to be the one to pay it. Christ pays it for you. And he has bought you away from law, the law, bought you away from sin, bought you away from those things that call out for your doom. And instead he says, no, I'm giving you my life and I'm giving you my righteousness. And I say you're righteous and therefore you are. And so you shall be and so you are. Verse 14. that to the nations the blessings of Abraham would come in Christ Jesus, so that the, the promise, the, the announcement, the, the, the declaration of the Spirit would come upon all, would come upon uh, people through faith. The way in which we're going to get the promised Spirit, the way we're going to get life is always through faith. So excuse me, I'm going to blow my nose. I smoked a pipe and activated my sinuses. Excuse me one moment. I'm sure that sounded lovely, but no, I, I when I went to Fort Wayne last week, I bought pipe tobacco and I thought I would have a nice little smoke outside in the cove while it was snowing and the snow was late in coming. But I still had my pipe anyway. Now I can breathe through my nose again. Very good. All right. So this, this is the point again here. That, that again, we receive things from God through faith as a promise, as a gift. Not, not by something that we earn, not by something that we do. So, just like Abraham received it. Abraham didn't do anything before God called him. No, God called him and then awesome things happened. I will pause there um, because we're basically at the midpoint of the chapter and uh, I'll see if there are any questions. Um, I was really surprised translating the second half of the chapter because there were far more words that I recognized. I thought it would be a lot tougher slogging and it's, it's got some interesting grammar, but like, oh yeah, I know most of these words. Like, I, I didn't think I was going to. This is, this is fun. So, um, are there any questions? If so, please type them in and uh, we'll, uh, we'll answer them as best we can. Okay. Uh, was his emphasis on blessings to the Gentiles? This is one of the things that is fascinating, and, and there's a, a debate that goes on. And I would argue that for most of the Old Testament, there is a strong understanding that the people of Israel, the the, the nation of Israel is meant to be a life unto the Gentiles. That, that when, when, when Simeon picks up Jesus in his hand and, and sings the Nunc Dimittis, a life to lighten uh, light Israel, a life to the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel, that this isn't something new. One of the things that goes on over and over in the Old Testament is that Israel is a blessing to their neighbors. And this is one of the promises to Abraham right, right off the beginning. In you all nations shall be blessed. And so it's not just that Israel is saved because God likes Israel, but everyone else is up the creek without a paddle. No, it, it's you're Israel, 
I have called you to be my people, to be the, the nation of priests, to be the, the place from whence the Messiah will come, but that's to be the benefit of everyone. Um, I'm doing an Exodus on Sunday morning. And, and God tells Israel that they will be a, a nation of priests. Well, it's not just the priest who get the benefit, it's the people around as well. And so this is the idea that, that Israel is to be the light on the hill so that everyone knows where to go to see the Messiah. And, and, and this is something that actually did play out much more than, that, than we often think about it. I mean, think about on the day of Pentecost, you have people from all over who have been drawn to Jerusalem from, from all those different ethnicities and from all those different areas. And that was something that went on even through the Old Testament. Jonah goes and preaches to Nineveh, the enemy, to be good for them. Um, Joseph saves Egypt and the, and the whole of that area. Um, or when Solomon is king, you have folks from all around coming to Jerusalem. And so that was part of the idea that, 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 that the God of Israel wasn't just Israel's local God, but he was the true God of the universe, the creator, and God who was meant to be for everyone. The, the God who would save and redeem all people by his own action. And that Israel was doing this for behalf of the world until the Messiah would come who would be the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So, so there was a distinction, but it wasn't Jews good, Gentiles bad. It was just as, it, okay, I, I'm the one who does the work up at the front by the, the, the pulpit. It doesn't mean pastor good, people who listen bad. It, it's just a different function. And, and, and when I'm preaching, it should be for the benefit of, of all who hear. What happens, and, and this really ratchets up in what's called the intertestamental period, um, basically from around 400 BC to around 30 AD, 430 years, keep that number in your back pocket because it keeps coming up over and over again, um, from the last book of the Old Testament to the time of, of John the Baptist, you, you don't have any more scripture. It's called the intertestamental period because things shift. Uh, Israel is conquered multiple times, becomes part of uh, Alexander the Great's empire. You start getting Greek being the common language instead of Persian type stuff and all that. And, and in that time period, there really developed a strong Jewish identity that we almost might today call toxic. <laughs> um, where, where, or, or nationalistic, to where the idea became, we're just on this for our own rather than our jobs to be for, for the world. They, they had lost their sense of mission, as it were, um, and had become more and more insular. And so by the time, you, it's when you had the rise of Pharisees, um, 500, in 500 BC, you didn't have Pharisees. They didn't exist as a group yet. Um, because everything was centered on the temple and worship and that. But in that, that time period when you don't have any of the prophets showing up and, and proclaiming, there becomes this more calcification of the Jewish identity that becomes much more internally focused, self-focused, and everyone else can do this. In fact, this is one of the things, even with uh, <clears throat> Jewish folks today, they don't, they don't generally proselytize. They don't try to, to bring people into the Jewish household. Who cares about them? And, and so that's something that, that really arises. Uh, and I think that if you were to go back and talk to the average member of Israel in, let's say, the time of David, there would be the understanding that the reason why God had sent David, the reason why we were here, was that we were to be the people of the promise, the people who would to be the would be the blessing. That that from from Israel, God would work out salvation. Now, 
if you got in the way of that salvation, you messed with Israel, you were in trouble. But God was going to work salvation. So, so there was a distinction between Jew and Gentile, but it was not one of antagonism, or should not have been. But, but it was just, we've got our job to do, but it's for your benefit. You don't get to do it, because it's not given to you. But it's going to be for your good. And that, that, was, that was the classical distinction. By the time you get to the New Testament time, that, that we're doing it for you, or, or we're going to be for your benefit, really has gone away. And, and, and a lot of that's just because they kept getting kicked in the teeth over and over again. But, but it went away. And so instead of the identity being where the people of faith who see the salvation of the world unfolding, it became where the people who do X, Y, and Z. And if you don't do X, Y, and Z, <clears throat> on you. And so, that, so, so, so I, I hope that kind of uh, flushes that out. Which is why Paul, when he wants to make his argument that salvation is by faith and not by works, he goes back to Abraham, because Abraham is by faith. That's the point. So, and the promise to Abraham was that, yes, all nations will be blessed in you. All right. I, 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 think, that, that, I think that works there. So let's, let's start at verse 15. And we'll, we'll go for a bit longer. I don't know if we're going to quite finish the chapter. We'll see. Um, but we'll, we'll get a good start off. <clears throat> Verse 15. Brothers, according to men I speak. I, I speak like I, I would with a human example. Let, 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 let me, most translations say, I, let me give a human example. I'm, I'm going to speak in the way of men. I'm going to give a folksy example. All right? So, something from everyday human life that you could understand. Um, it's like when uh, of men uh, a testament is ratified. No one adds to it or takes away. No one takes away from it or adds to it. All right. You guys have all done a testament, a will, a contract. Uh, that word testament, I, I think it's best to understand it as a will. All right. Someone writes a will. You don't add to it. And you don't take away from it. You let the will stand on its own. Because it, it, it's, it's the, the thing that's set up. You, you don't tamper with it. Tampering with, with wills or, or say, no, I'm going to ignore what, I'm going to ignore what dad wants. No, you don't do that. That is lousy. Every, every culture knows that that's lousy. That, that's, that's universally bad. You, 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 respect, you respect that covenant when it's been set down. Or if you sign a contract, you both abide by the contract. One person in the contract doesn't get to change the deal forever. But that, that's, that's wretched. All right? So that's the setup. If, even among men, we get how this works. Now, verse 36. But, but to Abraham, the promises were given. And to his seed. It did not say, and to his seeds, which would be many, but to one, and to your seed, which is Christ. Here we get fun grammar. You know the Greek word for seed. It's your, your seed, your, we, we often translate this as offspring, because that ends up being the, the, the idea. The only problem is when we look at this word offspring, we don't ever pluralize it. We don't say your offspring. If I just say, ah, oh, let me go check up on my offspring, that could be referring to either one offspring, Victor, or both of them, Victor and Ambrose doesn't work that way in, in, in Greek. You would either say offspring or offspring. We, we don't have a, a good cognate word in English that works that way. Uh, you could say to his seed, not to his seeds. But the, the point that Paul is making is that this promise is to Abraham and to his descendant, maybe. Not his descendants. 
Actually, that, that works well. Descendant versus descendant. And so th this is the thing that, that this promise to, to, to Abraham, that all nations will be blessed in you, there, there's, there's a one. There, there's a specific way that this is going to happen. This isn't just this, this wild, willy-nilly, all-over-the-place idea of blessing, but there's a specific thing that's going to happen through Abraham and through his descendants through the one who has the promise of the Messiah, and eventually to the one who is the Messiah, that's where the, the blessing is going to be. That's where everything is going to happen. That promise is there. So what you have with Abraham, what is received by faith, is the promise of the Messiah. And everything drives to the Messiah. All right? All right? But this I say, a, a testament that has been written and given, uh, set up by God, all right? This is, this is a, a strong, weird language, all right? Uh, this, this sentence is the hard one because that is the grammar that works weird. All right, so uh, <clears throat> this is what I'll say. A testament that has been ratified God by God, even after 430 years, uh, the law is given later, it doesn't undo or add to, it does not undo it or, or unwork the promise. Okay, so let me, let me rearrange that grammar in English to make it make sense in English. All right. When God gives a testament, if there's something else happens 430 years later in the law that doesn't unauthorize it, that doesn't undo the power of the promise, nor does it unwork the promise. It's really interesting because, okay, let, let me do the, the translation from here. Um, Verse 17 of the ESV is, this is what I mean. The law which came 430 years afterwards does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. That works really well as a translation. But the neat thing about that idea of annulling is literally a kuroi. It doesn't de-lord it. It doesn't unlord it. The promise was to the seed of David, who is the Lord. The law can't change the it can't unlordify Jesus Christ, who is the Lord. It can't unwork what Christ does and set the focus upon our work. That's not that you don't that that's not what God is doing by the law. That's not what God is doing by the Torah. That's not what Moses and the Bow were trying to do, even. So th this was a real okay. Let, I want to look at this one again very quickly. For this I say. A covenant which has been ratified by God. All right? There's a covenant that is ratified by God. That, um, now, on the one hand, you have a covenant ratified by, by God. Now, the law that is given 140 years later does not annul that, that covenant, nor uh, so as to uh, unwork the promise, to undo the promise. There. Whew! It was really weird. Well, and what it does is the grammar doesn't sound right in English. But what Paul is doing is he's emphasizing the, the, the covenant ratified by God, the promise of the Messiah. You had that promise. That's first and foremost. The law comes later. And it's not meant to undo that or, or un, unthrust it to make it empty and void. That's not its point. Verse 18. For if... Um, from the law, there is a, a uh, an inheritance. It's not by the promise, but to Abraham, there there has been a a a, a, a grace, a gift of, of a promise. That's what God God has graced a promise. God has graced Abraham through the promise. Okay, let's try that. Let me get that language together. For if the inheritance is by the law, it's not by the promise. But God graced, 
God has grace, given grace to Abraham through the promise. You get here that, that, that word for grace. God has graced Abraham through the promise. That, that's literally the, the language here. That's not by the law. That's not what it comes from. Where does the inheritance come from? Where does the promise to the, the descendant, the, the messianic descendant come from? It's a promise, not, not by law. It's not that one of your descendants will do enough stuff and then he'll get everything. It, 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 it's not, all right, old Uncle Joe died, and if one of us is brave enough to spend the night in the haunted house, we inherit his stuff. No, it's not that. This is a promise given. That's how Abraham got it. It was, it was grace. The, the word there for uh, it being given to him is literally, it has been grace to him. It, it's kadis, the, the word for grace. So it's this wonderful setup. No, Abraham received grace. Abraham lived by grace and faith, not by works. So why are you listening to people who are trying to say, oh, well, you know, you really have to do X, Y, and Z. That's what makes you really a Christian. They've missed the point. They've lost what Abraham did. <clears throat> so, now verse 19. What then is the law? Why the law? <laughs> Who is it? Who's the law then? What, what's the point? What, what is it? Why, why is it there? Um, for violators, for, for trespassers, it was set down. Because of transgressions, the, the, the law was given, was put down. Until the coming seed, the coming descendant, who was promised would come. So, so the law was given because of trespasses until the, uh, the, the, the promised seed would come. And, uh, oh, okay. Oh, okay. Oh, I got it. And, and this law was appointed by an, by an angel through the hand of a mediator. But uh, a, a mediator is not simply one, but God is one. All right, so this is, this is a bit of rhetoric that, that sounds a little weird to us, but it makes much more sense in, in Greek and to the people who think. <clears throat> um, in the ancient world, and even now, there was a difference between being spoken to directly and being spoken to by a middleman. Um, if I want Victor to pick up his room, and I say, Amber, go tell Victor to pick up your room. Okay, that means Dad wants it done. If I get up and then walk directly to Victor and say, Victor, you better pick up your room, there's an, a, a ratcheting up of the importance, the fact that I'm getting up and going directly. And so another way that, that Paul is showing that the promise was grander is that God speaking directly with Abraham. But with the law, you have other things involved. The law comes through through Moses, and that it, it you don't get to the people of Israel didn't get to go up on Sinai to receive the law. They couldn't. They couldn't bear it. There's there's go betweens. There's mediators. There. No, there, it's set down because you guys disobey. It's designed to to hem us in, to keep us in line. That's the purpose of the law. The purpose of the law is just to keep us from a uh, not wallowing in trespass, and so by trespass, ignoring the promise. Of course, if you're insisting that you're saved because you're circumcised, then you're actually engaging in trespass. But we're, we'll get to that in a bit. And so Paul is, is setting this on up. Setting this on up. Whew. And, and it's been very good. So, all right. I'm going to suggest that we pause here for the night, um, and we will stop at 3.20, because the next nine verses are wonderful, and 
they deal with a, a, a wonderful idea, the idea of the law as our pedagogue, as our keeper, until we get Christ. And that is a deep and profound conversation, and it's one that can be abused in a multitude of ways. In fact, um, looking at, at the end of this chapter, it's one of the most ab abused and ill-used um, passages of Scripture. And I want to take time to get into it. And it, it's, we're, we're 50 minutes in, and um, yeah, I, I, I don't want to go for another 40 minutes to, to get these next nine verses done like they ought. And um, just as I'm already 50 minutes in, I probably would go 50 minutes or 60 just because I'd be rambling. So let's, let's pause here. And we will pick up next week at Galatians 3, 21 and following. And, uh, and this actually works because it does carry on into chapter 4, really, with the, the thoughts and ideas. Um, really through, through verse 7, so that might work really well for next week. Um, and then even the, the stuff there. So yeah, we'll, we'll pause there, I think. Um, and if you were late for, for... Don't slip and slide going home. I hope not to. Um, I want to wrap up uh, <laughs> wrap up some thoughts from the beginning of, of Galatians here, Galatians three. <clears throat> One of the things that that really I think I appreciate most about Paul in Galatians is just this echo of by faith, by faith, and it's not. And Paul is pointing out something that, that is very important that, that preachers would do well to remember. When I preach, I'm not supposed to be preaching anything new to you. Now, I might have a factoid or a tidbit about the scriptures that you did not know. But it's all supposed to be Christ and him crucified. And, and, and even if I bring up some different nuance or a different analogy that you had not heard before. It still should be nothing but Christ, the faith of Christ. And the thing that Paul is pointing out is what he's preaching was nothing new. He hadn't seen it when he was trapped in, in, in works righteousness and the works of the law. But the promise by faith has been what's been going on from the beginning. As soon as Adam and Eve sin, the promise is given. I will put enmity between your seed and the woman's seed. Again, you get her descendant, her, her, her singular one, same idea. He's going to crush your head, Satan. And that's where we're at, where we have always been the people who've been waiting for the Messiah to deliver. And our, our friends, our brothers who were uh, in the times before Christ came, they, they didn't know what was going to happen. We're, we are the folks who have seen what has happened, but we live by the same faith. And, and this is really just the beautiful thing that Paul is pointing out. I, I love his... Um, one of the things that you can see in my, my Greek, oh, if you can see the, the things that are bolded up top, those are citations for the Septuagint. That, that, uh, it, it's the, here's your getting a quote from the Old Testament. And there's a lot of quoting the Old Testament here. Paul is just saying, yeah, it, this is by faith. That, that's what the scriptures say. If you really want to hold to the old-fashioned Jewish way, you've got to do it by faith. All this work stuff is just Johnny come lately hogwash. That needs to be avoided. I know, because I used to be the king of hogwash. So, um, we'll wrap up there. And we'll... Uh, We'll, we'll talk about pedagogues next week and what a pedagogue can do in ancient Greece and how fun and wonderful that would be. So, and also why that impacts Brown's uh, theory of education and why I often threaten to beat people with sticks. So, but that'll be for next time, if I don't forget that analogy. So if you want to remind me about be, uh, fustigation, beating people with sticks, you can remind me. But let's close up with prayer and then we'll head on our way. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, 
We give you thanks that by your word you have made us to hear the faith and you have given us the Holy Spirit so that we might believe and have life in the name of your Son, Jesus. Be with us. Make us to enjoy that life. Give us strength. Work in us to live in faith in you and in love to our neighbor. Give us rest of restful nights this evening. Keep safe all those who must be out in the weather. And keep us safe in our homes as well. Prepare us for all that you'd have us do in the morrow. This we pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. All right, have a good night, and I will see you all when I get to see you. The Lord be with you.